Well, good evening. Thank you all for coming to this uh, second of our uh, Exploring Space lectures for this year. My name is Bruce Campbell. I'm the chair of the Center for Earth and Planetary Studies here at the National Air and Space Museum. And it's my pleasure, first of all, to acknowledge the generous support of uh, our sponsors for this uh, series, Aerojet Rocketdyne and the United Launch Alliance. Uh, these two companies have been instrumental. Yes? Very good. These two companies have been instrumental in launching and propelling many of the spacecraft that uh, you've seen explore the solar system over the last uh, many years. Uh, I think we'd also like to acknowledge uh, Congressman Culberson as well, as uh, Bob did. And tonight we are fortunate to have with us Dr. Bob Papalardo, who as you've seen is the Europa Mission Project Scientist at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in California. Bob received his PhD in geology from Arizona State University. Prior to that, while at Brown University, he helped plan the Galileo spacecraft's observations of Jupiter's icy satellites. And after Brown, he became an assistant professor at the University of Colorado in Boulder. He joined the Jet Propulsion Lab in 2006, where his research focuses on the processes that shape the icy satellites of the outer solar system. Now join me, please, in welcoming Bob Papalardo. Thank you very much, Bruce. This is uh, a pleasure to be here, an honor to be here to talk about Europa, one of the most spectacular objects in the solar system. Um, not just because it has really cool geology, but also because there is the possibility that there could be life in a global scale ocean beneath its icy shell. This is our spacecraft, the current best representation of the spacecraft that we hope can visit uh, Europa as soon as the mid-2020s. Um, as I mentioned in the Q&A, uh, we've been working for nearly 20 years to get going a dedicated mission to Europa since the discoveries from the Galileo mission uh, showed that Europa most likely has this global ocean. So we're going to talk a little about why we think there's a global ocean, what that implies in terms of the possibilities for life. We'll look at the cool geology and we'll talk about this spacecraft mission and what it can do toward plumbing Europa's ice shell, telling us where there's water, um, what the characteristics of Europa might be like, essentially whether it may be a habitable environment, and then the next steps beyond that. Here's the star of our show. It doesn't look like, it's about the size of Earth's moon, but it sure doesn't look like Earth's moon. It's not covered with impact craters. Instead, we see these bright planes uh, crisscrossed by these weird lines and some darker kind of mottled areas, but very few impact craters visible in this image. In fact, from the number of uh, the, the paucity of large impacts, here's one. That's not one, that's something else. Uh, we can get an idea of the age of Europa's surface. Europa was formed with the rest of the solar system about four and a half billion years ago. But um, the surface has been repaved. From the few craters, we, we know one 20, 10 to 20 kilometer crater should form about every four million years. So you count them all up and you say, well, that surface must be only about 60 million years old. Something has repaved Europa since the time dinosaurs roamed the Earth. It's these ingredients for life that I want you to kind of see interwoven here as we go forward. Uh, when, and this is the case in we, when we think about exploring Mars or Europa or another planetary world, does it have a solvent, like liquid water is the best one, uh, for the kinds of chemical reactions that could allow for life? Does it have the right elements from which organic molecules could be built. A tough one is whether there is the right chemical energy for reactions that could power life. Because 
at Europa, we don't, we're not gonna have life at the surface. Um, you'll see why, but maybe there could be life in the interior ocean. And are these ingredients around for a while? If, they're, if they just show up for a few years or even a few million years, that might not be enough. The moons of Jupiter were discovered in 1610 by Galileo, and so collectively they bear his name, the Galilean moons. So uh, that was, this is the discovery photo. <laughs> um, and this is what we know today based on the Galileo mission, the mission that was named for Galileo Galilei, that orbited Jupiter from 1995 to 2003, and every time, every couple of months, it would do an orbit, and every, every orbit it would fly by one of these large moons. And about a dozen times it flew by Europa. And we know some from telescopic observations. We know some from previous observations from the Voyager spacecraft that flew past the two Voyager spacecraft that flew through the Jupiter system. But most of what we know is from the Galileo mission. So let's take a closer look at Europa itself. I mentioned the, the bright plains, the dark mottled terrain. There's another crater here that spewed ejecta across the surface of Europa. Let's look close up at that ridged plains. It's crisscrossed by these bizarre ridges and grooves and associated kind of dark material. What the heck's going on there? It's really no like nothing we see on Earth. And then there are these chaotic regions, these regions where the surface is broken up, kind of like cooking hamburger on a grill or something there. The, the pre-existing terrain is just crumbled away. We'll take a look more closely at both of those. Um, this is what we think we know about Europa's interior. Um, we know this from gravity data and from magnetometry data and from putting the pieces together, what we know about how planets work and the compositions out in the outer solar system. So we can use gravity data to tell us how centrally concentrated Europa is. So as the Galileo spacecraft flew by Europa, it would uh, Europa would perturb the orbit of the spacecraft just a little bit. And from that, we can actually say, oh, Europa must be denser down in its center than it is elsewhere. Um, and if we take the assumption that what makes up moons out there is things like iron and things like rock and things like water ice, then you get a model something like this. Um, about 100 kilometers of H2O, what's that, about 60 miles of H2O, some of which may be liquid, as we'll talk about. Um, the best model is that the water ice shell may be about 20 kilometers, about 13 miles thick, and we'll talk about that a little bit as well. But that, there's, that leaves about 80 kilometers of liquid water above a rocky seafloor. That is, makes for about twice the volume of all the Earth's oceans combined. Uh, at little Europa, the size of Earth's moon. So the gravity data tells us that Europa is centrally concentrated. We actually know from telescopic and Voyager observations that there's ice on the surface. Why do we think there's a liquid water ocean? Well, some of that evidence comes from geology, but the best evidence actually comes from magnetic data, from understanding the magnetic field in the vicinity of Europa. So the Galileo spacecraft had a magnetometer, and as the spacecraft sailed by Europa, there was a signal that looked like Europa has a magnetic field. Oh, okay, maybe it has a magnetic field of its own. Ganymede, its neighbor, has a magnetic field of its own, so not completely crazy. But then the Galileo spacecraft flew by again, and the magnetic field had shifted, like completely turned around. Um, so magnetic fields don't just flip on really short time scales. So 
what was realized, because actually Callisto seemed to be doing the same thing, is that um, Europa is behaving as a conductor. There's something inside Europa in the shallow subsurface that's essentially conducting electricity. Uh, it, it's kind of like Europa set off the, the, uh, a metal detector. Let me explain what I mean. J Jupiter has a gigantic magnetic field. If you could see it in the sky, the angular size of Jupiter's magnetic field as viewed from Earth would be about the size of the full moon in the sky. Um, incredibly powerful magnet. And Europa is orbiting within that. Well, Europa feels a changing magnetic field of Jupiter because of the geometry, the tilt of Jupiter's magnetic field as it rotates around. So Europa is just minding its own business orbiting Jupiter, but it feels a changing magnetic field uh, from Jupiter. And Europa seems to be uh, creating a magnetic field of its own to counter Jupiter's. So, so back to the metal detector idea. If I, if I take my iPhone through a metal detector, it sets it off because metal detector is like a big magnet. And if I take something, if I move something metal through a magnet, it creates another little magnetic field to counter that and sets off the metal detector. So that's kind of what Europa did to the Galileo spacecraft. It said, oh, something's, something's weird here. So that tells us there's a conductor in the shallow subsurface of Europa. Well, what conducts electricity in the shallow subsurface of an icy moon? Salty water would. And so that's the best evidence that there's an ocean within Europa comes from that magnetic field data. Uh, we don't know how thick that ocean is or how salty. That's something we want to do with this follow-up mission, but we're pretty sure there's an ocean up in there. We'd like to confirm it. We'd like to confirm it with other data, of course. This is kind of the interior picture of Europa. Scales are exaggerated a little bit. And um, why would Europa have a liquid water ocean within it today if it's only the size of Earth's moon. We know Earth's moon is pretty cold and dead today. Um, so shouldn't Europa have lost all of its internal heat by now, after four and a half billion years, just like our moon has lost most of its internal heat? There's another source of heating out there that doesn't apply, at least doesn't apply anymore, to our moon. And that's called tidal heating coming from tidal flexing. Um, Europa, as it orbits Jupiter, uh, gets a little closer and a little farther. Again, not to scale, but the orbit's a little egg-shaped, a little bit eccentric. When Europa is closest to Jupiter, it is stretched out more. And when it's farthest from Jupiter, it contracts a bit. And kind of like bending a paperclip, back and forth, that generates heat. It's frictional heat as Europa is flexed. Again, not to scale, but Europa, every time it orbits Ju Jupiter, every 85 hours, every three and a half Earth days, its ice shell is flexing by about 30 meters. That's the prediction for how much it would flex as it goes around. That'll generate a lot of heat. Some of you may know Io, Europa's neighbor, um, is the most volcanically active body in the solar system. That's the moon one in, the Galilean moon one in from Europa. It flexes something like 100 meters. It's crazy uh, it, to generate all that heat at Io. Well, a little farther out at Europa, it's not enough to make a super volcanically active body, but it's enough, we think, to maintain a liquid water ocean. And you do the math and you say, OK, it makes sense for the ice shell to be something like 20 or 30 kilometers thick above um, uh, above an ocean, uh, in turn above the rock. We don't know how much of that tidal heat is in the rocky part of Europa. If the tidal heat is just in the ice shell, that's enough to maintain an ocean. But it could be that there's a bunch of heat put into the mantle as well to keep it warm and for there to be uh, volcanoes down on the seafloor of Europa. We don't know yet. So something else we want to do with a mission is we want to test for this flexing. We want to fly by Europa when it's at different places in its orbit and measure the gravitational field very precisely. And by doing that, we'll be able to infer how much it's flexing and to nail in another way 
the idea that Europa has an ocean down there. All this tidal flexing kind of breaks the surface too. Um, and so when we look at pictures like this of Europa, we're zooming into some of the highest resolution Galileo data here. Um, that may help explain these ridges and cracks that crisscross the surface. Although, just what the heck is making something like this? The most common feature on Europa are these ridges, and they come in pairs, these double ridges that's going up and then into the center and then up again and down. The light's coming from, from this way, from the right. Um, I, I think the best model for this is kind of like a, a tree root growing beneath an asphalt sidewalk and pushing it upward to make a double ridge and break the cold, brittle ice on Europa. And it may be because that stretching creates cracks and then those cracks, there's movement back and forth and that back and forth movement creates heat and that warm ice wants to rise up like a tree root beneath the sidewalk. That's, I think, a good way to explain these ridges, but there's no scientific consensus actually as to how these form. They're, they may relate to uh, um, water welling up from the interior. They may relate to, to compression, pushing together the surface. So there are a lot of different ways uh, uh, scientists have thought of to explain these ridges and really going there and understanding the geological relationships close up and even understanding the 3D nature of the subsurface is gonna tell us how these form. And we'll talk a little bit about how to do that. Well, one of the things I could say here is that the Galileo mission was very limited. Its antenna didn't open. It sent back its data at 40 bits per second through a secondary antenna the size of a coffee can lid. The older folks in the crowd will know what a coffee can lid. <laughs> um, and, and, and so, we don't have a lot of the surface covered. With the upcoming mission, we're gonna get uh, all of the surface covered at 50 to 100 meters per pixel uh, imaging resolution. Um, there are also these things that are called bands. This one's a sickle-shaped one uh, across the surface of Europa. And if you look at the older structures, the things it cuts, you can imagine and there's, there's this thing up here that's kind of funny looking and then this down here is kind of funny looking and this ridge and this ridge. They'd fit back together if in Photoshop you cut this thing out and put, push the edges back together. And well, we've done that. Photoshop is our friend in planetary science. There it is. So here, that, that's what that used to look like and that and that. And a crack came and split the surface and the surface pulled apart somehow to form these bands. Um, here a colleague illustrated this version. This probably took 10 million years to happen, but this is an idea of how these bands opened up. So something is pulling apart the crust and allowing warmer material to ooze out. Some have argued it's water. Um, I think it's more likely that warm glacial flowing ice oozed out over something like 10 million years. So it's kind of like plate tectonics that we have on the Earth, where there are areas where the surface is pulled apart. And just recently, there was a, a paper that describes some evidence of a place where the surface seems to have pushed together, and there might be something like subduc subduction zones, where, like on Earth, one plate dives beneath another. Very cool geology, but we need to understand more. And what are the implications for water, and where is there water? What's the role of water? in creating these features. Um, there are some impacts. This is that one with the bright rays. It's a Welsh name, Pwyll, we know it by, but Pwyll, I can't really pronounce my Welsh, um, is what it's named for. And it, but it still doesn't look like a crater on the moon because it's very shallow. It formed into something relatively warm, like, like poking a warm cake, it rebounded back up. That's about 20 kilometers across. And then you go to bigger structures, there are only two of these, and they kind of look like bullseyes. So this is a place where you'd expect a big crater, but instead there are these rings. And what probably happened is that the impact was large enough to punch through the crater that formed, punch through the entire icy shell. And water raced in, and the crater filled in with ice and slush, and pulled into the center to break uh, the, the surface in these concentric rings. So again, only two of these, and it suggests that 
these impacts penetrated through an ice shell about 20 kilometers thick, 13 miles thick. Um, so, but that stuff in the center probably came from down in that ocean. We saw a lot of reddish looking things. Wherever the surface of Europa has been breached in some way, there seems to be this reddish stuff. What I suspect is going on is that the, the bright icy stuff surrounding it is probably just a thin coating. And if you went to Europa and dusted it off, you'd probably see this dark stuff. Um, so what is this dark reddish stuff? Well, we're not so sure. We can look at the spectral fingerprints, the fingerprints of light reflected off of Europa's surface. Uh, people do this from Earth using Earth-based telescopes or Hubble telescope. Um, and with the Galileo mission, we were able to do it from flybys. Uh, and with the upcoming mission, we'll do it even better uh, with flybys and other, other techniques. Uh, the idea here is we're, we're looking at reflection off the surface in near infrared wavelengths, right? Be beyond the color red where our eyes can't see, longer wavelengths. And we can look at, at the at the um, how much light is reflected off the surface versus the wavelength. We can see down in here, but not out here. So this blue curve is what ice looks like. It, there are these very characteristic dips. I don't do this for a living, but good friends and colleagues who do, and they're like, oh yeah, that's water ice, right? Because they know there's this dip right here at 1.5 microns, micrometers, micrometers, and another at two. Um, and then they'll look at this and say, oh, well, there's water in there, but that's not water ice because they're not as deep and they're somewhat asymmetric. They're just displaced for, for compare the shapes, not, not the vertical um, uh, offset. And, and so what can make it that subtly different shape? Well, um, the, the best fits are magnesium sulfate hydrate. That's Epsom salt. If this stuff came from the ocean, that could be a pretty good place to take a bath. Um, but the other good fit is uh, sulfuric acid hydrate. That's battery acid, which is not a good place to take a bath. Um, so, and, it, and the truth is probably somewhere in between. They're probably both of these things. What's probably going on is that there's stuff that's come from the interior and welled up to the surface and um, even flowed on the surface. Uh, that contains Epsom salts. But once it gets to the surface, then Jupiter's radiation takes over. So I had that illustration of Jupiter's magnetic field. Jupiter's a giant particle accelerator when there are charged particles out there, as there are lots of them, because Io is a litter bug, and then things get uh, with its volcanoes, and then things get charged, ionized. And then they get accelerated by Jupiter and they're whipping around. Jupiter's rotating every 10 hours, and these things are going around every 10 hours, even though they're really far from Jupiter. They're going at incredibly high velocities, and they're slamming into Europa. Um, and that'll break apart H2O, water, into H, floats away, and O, which hangs around on the surface. Um, and if there's magnesium sulfate hydrate, well, there'll be magnesium hanging around and sulfur because all these things get broken up and can recombine and some of it recombines probably to form battery acid. Um, so that's a simple story, but it's probably not the real story. In other words, we need to understand better these little wiggles because we could tell pretty precisely what's on the surface, what other salts are on the surface, and whether there are organic materials on the surface in this dark stuff if we could see the finer wig wiggles uh, in these curves um, and, and if we had a more sensitive instrument with higher resolution, and that's what we'll have with the upcoming mission. The upcoming mission will also be able to catch tiny dust particles that are knocked off of Europa's surface and analyze them and, and right there at the spacecraft and say, oh, look, there's organics in here, right? Send us back the data. We'll say, look, there are organics in here. Um, and there's also on board, there will be, uh, a mass spectrometer that will sniff the atmosphere. It's a very thin atmosphere around Europa. It's 10 to the minus 12 of, Europe, of Earth's atmosphere. Um, and 
and look for the gases, and that includes volatile organics that might be out there, and tell very precisely uh, what chemicals are down, what's the chemistry of this dark stuff on the surface. Um, by the way, neither magnesium sulfate nor battery acid is red. Uh, a recent idea is that it might be table salt, NaCl. When you irradiate it in the lab, turns this kind of brownish color. So that's an interesting idea, and there is some evidence for sodium at Europa. So we need to understand the chemistry to really get at the habitability of the ocean. What is the interior of the ocean uh, like? What's its composition like? And to understand what part of it is from external factors. Um, and keep in mind that oxygen that I mentioned breaking apart, because that's going to be a key part of the story coming up. Um, if we look at the surface, we see these spots and pits uh, littering the surface. They're called lenticulae, Latin for freckles. I kind of have to give them a fancy name. Uh, there's something like five, ten kilometers across. They're, they're sort of rounded. They, some, they commonly occur together. Um, and as a geologist, I knew when these pictures first came back, I've seen that somewhere before. And the somewhere is places like, um, well, I haven't seen it, I've seen it in books, but places like the Gulf of Mexico where there is salt that moves up from below sediment and, and comes and pops its way up through the sediments. Well, that's probably not exactly what's happening in Europa, but something close to it. It's probably ice, warm ice rising up from the base of the ice shell like a lava lamp. Again, I'm showing my age, so older ones in the crowd. Uh, no, no lava lamps. Um, the, the tidal heat we talked about is, is best, there's the most tidal heat down near the base of the ice shell where the ice is warmest. And so this warm ice wants to rise up through colder ice. And so you get these blobs moving up. Here's a simulation uh, done by Amy Barr back when she was a grad student with me in Colorado many years ago. And in her model, the, the base of this is, uh, is the, roughly the temperature of the ocean, of salt, salty ocean, and the surface is frigid. So Europa's surface is 100 degrees Kelvin, that's minus 280 Fahrenheit, or if you like Celsius, minus 170 Celsius. So very cold and stiff ice. But the ice down here is, is kind of, you know, it, it's warm enough to flow like glaciers flow. Ice flows over long time scales. This is way sped up. It'll be something like um, 100, thousand years for ice down here to rise up toward, uh, to, to near the surface. But it probably happens over long time scales. And then the colder ice will sink down to replace it. So this is a way that Europa's ice shell may circulate stuff from the bottom, including any organisms if they're down there in the ocean, can get up to the surface and stuff near the surface can get down into the ocean. Um, again, this, this is going to play a role as we talk about chemical energy here in just a few minutes. Um, oh, sorry. I didn't mention that, right, the, how do you get this stuff to the surface? So this warm ice isn't getting all the way up because it's so cold and so stiff. So if the surface is fractured, it might be able to make its way all the way up to the surface. Um, there's one more major type of feature on Europa, and this one uh, probably directly relates to liquid water, and that's the aptly named chaos terrain, where blocks, big iceberg-like blocks, have moved around, rotated, translated in this more hamburger-like stuff, kind of like I showed early on. So something has caused the surface to break up. Some heat source 
from below has probably caused the surface to break up for features to move around, right? Like this probably fit back together with that. These guys fit back together real well. This looks like it's tilted a bit. Something has disrupted the surface here. Um, let's take a look at this area, Konamara Chaos, as it's called. From all the way out, let's zoom in. So that chaos region is here. I was in my office at Brown when we were planning the Galileo images when my friend Jeff called and said, Bob, we have to take pictures of the red rabbit. I'm like, Jeff, what are you talking about? The bunny. Here it is, the upside down bunny. And we did. We ended up retargeting images that were going to be taken somewhere else to this area, which even from a distance looked like it was going to be fascinating. And so we're going to zoom into various levels of Galileo data taken at different times during the mission to see this region revealed. So now you see these kind of plates that we were looking at earlier that broke apart. These bright areas are actually stuff that was tossed out of the crater Pwil, Puch, a thousand kilometers away. Zooming down now into images at about 55 meters per pixel show these rotated, twisted blocks. Uh, this is about the size of a small city. We used to compare it to Providence. Uh, this is about the size of, a, of an interstate highway. And then we'll zoom into some of the highest resolution images of the tour where Konamara chaos starts to become like a place, something like Monument Valley with plateaus and cliffs and stuff that has shed down off these cliffs. We're about 10 meters per pixel now. Whoops. Get rid of that little bar. And then we go out into the surroundings and see some of these iceberg-like regions. There's a ridge that's seen better days. That's about a kilometer across, if I remember. But the Titanic would be about that big for scale. <laughs> um, but this doesn't look like a smooth skating pond like it was liquid water. But certainly liquid water is needed to allow these blocks to move around as much as they have here. So is this literally an exposure of the ocean? Or maybe some of these blobs of warm ice have risen up and kind of like on a, a mosh pit that move the surface around? Crowd surfing. I always get that wrong. That's what it is. Um, well, one of the best models was a relatively recent one that kind of combines the idea that there's melting and that there's this convection, this warm ice that's bubbled up from below. That if there's this, these blobs of warm ice are places where tidal heating will concentrate. Because they're warm and they're rising up, that ice is squishier than the colder ice surrounding. So that squishy ice can heat up more to the point that there's melting right within the ice shell, creating a pocket of melt. And if there's a pocket of melt, um, the surface above could just collapse into it and then it refreezes again later. So that's a nice model for how these chaos regions might form. Um, it, it's pretty tough to get liquid water exposed to space at Europa uh, with 100 Kelvin at the surface, but for short amounts of time it is possible uh, that there could be bubbling and frothing. Remember, there's a vacuum. It'll go right to a solid. Uh, which leads into a relatively recent finding from the Hubble Space Telescope. The tantalizing evidence for plumes at Europa. Those familiar with Saturn and Enceladus, Enceladus is a very active moon orbiting Saturn, and it has plumes of water vapor that are spewing out of it. Well, the Hubble Space Telescope in the ultraviolet found some bright regions on the limb of Europa from a few years ago. And it's oxygen and it's hydrogen that's glowing there at the limb of Europa. Um, and so that could mean that there was some sort of outburst and then 
you know, the radiation comes along and breaks it up into O and H, and maybe that's what we were seeing. But then NASA was intrigued by this idea and gave lots of Hubble telescope time to the group that found this, and they looked for months and months and never saw it again. So was this a big outburst and could only be seen once? Was the result not really right because it's a really hard observation to make? We're not sure. So as we plan our mission, we're planning for the possibility there might be plumes. We want to look and see if we can spot them. And then if they're there, we want to fly through them. Because if we're measuring the composition of the dust and the gas around Europa and fly through one of these, we could directly sample what's in the subsurface of Europa by flying through a plume, which would be just fantastic. So we have an ultraviolet instrument on the mission, our plume hunter, to go after whether there are plumes at Europa. So to sum up the ingredients for life, water, much more than all of the Earth's oceans combined. Essential elements, well, we saw this dark reddish stuff. Um, we don't know if there are organics there. We don't really know the composition yet. We have to find out. Really, we, we know number one. Number two, well, we have ideas. We don't know. We need to keep exploring and get there and find out. But one would think that from Europa's formation and from later impacts, bringing uh, uh, the right materials to Europa, that it should probably be there. Uh, the right elements to build organic molecules, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, nitrogen, sulfur. Chemical energy is a hard one. So. What we're talking about again is, is, could there be enough energy for life down here in the ocean? Um, because you're not going to get sunlight, you're not going to get photosynthesis going on down beneath 20 kilometers of ice. For that matter, light penetrates you know, not too far into, um, into ice. Uh, well, on Earth, there are lots of organisms that don't care about sunlight. They live off other chemical reactions. Um, these guys don't care about sunlight. They live off the chemical energy from these black smokers on the Earth's ocean floors, places where water has seeped through cracks and pores in the rock um, and hit places in the rocky interior, uh, not too f far down, where warm rock is welling up. And that water gets charged with chemical nutrients, comes back out into the cold water, and those chemical nutrients just condense out. And these critters live very close to such things. Um, so could there be the chemical energy for life at Europa? Well, in Europa's seafloor, there might be very similar chemical energy pouring out of the subsurface. And we've got another source, too. The H2O here getting bombarded by radiation, breaking up into H and O, leaving the oxygen behind. If all the oxygen and other oxidants on Europa's surface could be dumped into Europa's ocean, Europa's ocean would, have more, would be more oxygenated than Earth's oceans are. So there's the potential for lots of fuel for life at Europa's surface that could get, if it can get into the ocean. So the circulation of Europa's ice shell, like that convection we talked about, or like melting to form these chaos regions, is really critical. Understanding what's going on inside the ice shell to the idea of whether there could be life at Europa. Can we get those oxidants, the fuel for life, into Europa's ocean? Because if we just have the other part of the reaction, the reductants, not good enough. We need both sides of the battery. Um, so the mission we're talking about carries an ice-penetrating radar. Uh, at long wavelengths, um, and, and Bruce Campbell is part of that radar team, at long wavelengths, uh, ice is pretty transparent to a radar signal. It can go right through cold, clean ice. And if it hits liquid water, it's going to bounce back through that ice and back up to the spacecraft. So we're going to carry a radar that will broadcast at Europa and then listen to what comes back. And we're going to be plumbing the ice shell, trying to understand where there is liquid water within. 
that radar will penetrate at least a few kilometers. The hope is it could penetrate all the way through the ice shell as well. Um, as for stable environment, Europa's probably been simmering tidally heated for billions of years. We don't know that for sure. Uh, further understanding of the evolution of the Galilean satellites as a whole uh, will hopefully tell us that. So this leads into the goals and objectives for the Europa mission. Oh, I'm going to have to speed through a little bit. I have some cool graphics. So give me the hook when you need to. Um, overall, we want to understand the ocean, the ice shell, its composition, its geology. We also want to understand what the surface looks like close up. Because someday, after this mission, maybe soon after this mission, we want to send a lander to the surface. Because if you want to go beyond habitability, beyond understanding could Europa have life, you want to go touch the surface, sample that stuff, get beneath the layer where radiation has messed stuff up, and scoop some of that stuff up from tens of centimeters below the surface, and look for signs of life. Um, so, before we can do that, we need to understand the surface, where we want to go scientifically, and how rough is it, are there places we can land that are smooth. This is the best Galileo picture of Europa, six meters per pixel, somewhat oblique, like you're looking at an airplane window, and boy, that looks like a tough place to land. But that's what the JPL engineers are studying right now, whether we could send a lander to a place like this, or how. We know we could do it. This is our labeled version of our spacecraft. Uh, here are, uh, well, first of all, it's, it's solar. Uh, here are the solar panels. Each of these eight panels is about two by four meters in size. Uh, let's see, radio uh, antenna for communicating with Earth, magnetometer boom. Um, these are the radar antennas. There are high frequency antennas, two of them, each 16 meters long, uh, and VHF antennas, um, four of them, each about two meters long that we plan to attach to the solar panels. The solar panels are essentially going to be part of the radar system. Uh, the instruments like the cameras and the spectrometers are looking down at the surface of Europa, while the, the instruments like the dust detector and, and the mass spectrometer that's looking for gases are pointing in the direction we're moving. So it's like they're here and looking down and we're flying through this stuff that those instruments want to sense while looking down um, at, uh, at what uh, the cameras want to see. So that way, all the instruments can work at the same time. If any of you are familiar with the Cassini spacecraft, the instruments are kind of bolted all over, and only a couple can work during any flyby of, say, Titan at Saturn. We want all the instruments to work at the same time, both for the scientific synergy that brings and because this is a nasty radiation environment. We don't want our spacecraft bathing in radiation while two instruments look. We want them all looking at the same time. Um, I mentioned most of the instruments, so I won't dwell here, uh, but I'll, I'll, just, I'll just name them quickly. I mentioned mass spectrometer, sniffs the gases, dust analyzer for the dust, magnetometer, uh, a, a plasma instrument helps out the magnetometer in doing its job of, of understanding how salty and thick that ocean is. Uh, ultraviolet to search for plumes. Camera system can get up to half meter per pixel images of the surface of Europa uh, for reconnaissance and for understanding the surface close up. Infrared spectrometer, uh, ice penetrating radar. Whoops, I forgot one. Uh, the uh, thermal imager is going to look for hot spots. Are there places that are warm enough at Europa that they're essentially glowing hot and we can detect that heat? Uh, it's the telecommunication system, the radio of the spacecraft, that does the gravity science that I mentioned earlier. There are a couple of ways to get to Europa. We can take an EVGA trajectory, Earth, Venus, Earth, Earth, gravity assist. That's a lot of time spent in the inner solar system getting up enough energy to get out to Jupiter with the mass of this spacecraft. In fact, it would take seven and a half years. The launch period that we're shooting for, if budgets allow, um, and if NASA says to go in that direction, is May 2022. 
is when the launch period would open. So that's the earliest we would be launching. Um, so that's a conventional rocket, like an Atlas, a Delta IV, maybe the Falcon Heavy. Um, but NASA is developing the SLS, the Space Launch System, a big, big rocket that we could take on a direct trajectory to Jupiter. And if it's ready in time, we, the um, time of flight to Jupiter is about 2.7 years, less than three years. That would be nice. As, as our project manager says, kind of my engineering uh, uh, peer equivalent at, at uh, JPL, um, he, he hopes so because he wants to get there before he retires. <laughs> so once we get there, then what happens? I, I've been talking about these tours and the, the, the pedals, um, the flybys, but what does that really mean? Here's a depiction of the spacecraft coming in. Uh, here's the orbit of Europa. Jupiter's down the center there. And it's showing when we get first captured by Jupiter, a long uh, orbit or pedal and the beginning of the second. Well, let's look at this animated here. Once we make all these flybys, we're going to envelop Europa in a web of flybys um, that, here, I'll skip to my, that one. There it is from the side. We're, uh, we're going to envelop Europa with something like 45 flybys. This isn't an orbiter around Europa itself, but it's an orbiter around Jupiter. But every time it makes a flyby of Europa, and after 45, my Star Trek reference, we get kind of like a Tholian web formed <laughs> around Europa, enveloping it, encasing it, and it allowing us to sample all latitudes and longitudes around Europa. see if I can get that to work. Um, one last piece of the puzzle is that we are beginning studies, as I mentioned, of a possible lander. Not to join the Clipper mission, the, the Europa mission that we've been talking about, but to follow up soon after. Um, and the idea is to try to get um, a few tens of kilograms of scientific instruments similar to Spirit and Opportunity's uh, payload mass down to Europa's surface. And we're looking at trying to land something like this guy. Um, and in doing so, use something like a mini sky crane, like was used at Mars, to help descend this little guy to the surface that would be designed to be able to withstand a range of possible uh, surface features, right? Europa might be very um, uh, lumpy and hard to land on, or maybe we'll find some really nice smooth spots. But the goal is to, to get to the surface the kinds of instruments that could detect organic materials directly with big samples that are scooped out from the subsurface. So um, we'll see the results of these studies in the coming year or so. So to wrap up, 
Europa, first seen over 400 years ago, has the potential, exploration of Europa, has the potential to really revolutionize science in the coming decades. We have lots of um, examples of chemical reactions, and we have lots of examples of rocks, and we have lots of examples of, um, of other natural phenomena. We only have one real example of life to study. Uh, biology is pretty much uh, the same on Earth. All things are related in that there are 20 amino acids. Everything uses ATP to store energy. If we could find an example of life, of different life, of an, life of an independent origin of Europa, it would revolutionize our understanding of biology. So that's a practical implication of finding life there. But beyond that, the question of are we alone um, is one that's been with us for a long time. It's one that sometimes we just assume it in science fiction, but we really don't know how common is life out there in the universe. If we could find another example of life right here in our solar system, that would say that life is very common. And if it's not there, maybe it would say, hey, life is that much more rare than we thought. And the same place that revolutionized science 400 years ago, when following Galileo's observations, we realized there are other planets out there. We're not the center of the universe. That place, Europa, one of those moons that Galileo first saw and realized we're not the center of the universe, has the potential to revolutionize science again. So with that, I thank you, and we'll take some questions. Please see our website for more information. I'll take the, the, those in turn. So the ice penetrating radar, if it sees to the ice, it's never going to make it all the way down to the, um, to the ocean floor. It's going to be a challenge making it through 20 kilometers, 10 or 20 kilometers of ice if it's there, because it's difficult for ice penetrating radar to get through cold, uh, sorry, warm, dirty ice. And we think Europa's ice might be warm and dirty. It's easier for it to get through cold, clean ice. So what we're hoping for is regions, areas, where it's cold and clean enough that it'll get all the way through the ice. But it's not gonna, it's, that signal won't make it beyond. As for lander, yes, uh, there's definitely thought of, well, after an initial lander, then might we be able to someday get into the liquid water, whether it be a lake or all the way down uh, into the ocean of Europa. So, but a lander would certainly want to at least dig beneath the depth that, uh, that radiation has processed the surface. I'm going to attempt to restart as we're going here. Uh, yes. So is tidal heating the same, or does it always increase? So very complex question. In other words, the, the answer is very complex. Um, well, maybe it's simple. We don't know. But where the ice is warmest is where we think the tidal heating will concentrate. 
Um, and so the, where it's warmest may move around. You might have a big upwelling, and then the heat concentrates there to the point it melts. Melted water doesn't tidally heat, and so now it cools off, and maybe somewhere else it's heating up more. Um, now, that said, we think there may be a cycle on the order of 100 million years where Europa as a whole gets warmer and then cooler again. Um, and this is because Io is thought to be in a cycle where its eccentricity, how, how oval that orbit is, changes over time. And Io pulls Europa along with it. it it's an amazingly complex and, and interesting system. And so it's probably true that Europa has 100 million year cycles of being warmer and colder as related to Io getting warmer and colder in its orbit because of its orbit changing. Um, the evidence seems to me to point to, and, and to other geologists, seems to point to we may be in a waning phase right now. We might have to wait around another 50, 100 million years before Europa really gets going again. Yeah, 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 absolutely right. There, there, it's, um, there's not a lot of solar energy out there, but we're using solar panels. Juno, the Juno mission is paving the way. It's on the way to Jupiter, and it's using solar panels. What we did is we looked at the instruments that we thought NASA would select, um, and we said, yeah, we can power those with solar. And then NASA, in picking the instruments that were proposed, said to us, OK, can you accommodate these instruments if we pick something kind of like this? And we looked at it carefully, and we said yes. Um, as we're learning more, of course, we're learning that, oh, oh, this instrument, oh, yeah, we forgot to tell you we want to run for more of the orbit. Oh, yeah, well, it's going to be harder to do the radar than we thought, or harder to do uh, the mass spectrometer than we thought. So um, it's starting to push the system. but. Unlike a nuclear mission where you have where your your quanta you, you'd have to add another entire uh, 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 RTG or unit um, to power the spacecraft, we can add more panels. And so originally we were thinking three panels on each side. We're up to four panels on each side going into the the NASA selection. We might need a fifth. And so, but we can grow incrementally that way. Uh, in cost and in mass, rather than adding another giant uh, radiothermal unit, nuclear powered unit. Way in the back corner up there. Um, so, does the the radi does the the radiation environment at Europa make it impossible to send people there? Again, I want to instill the use of crude mission, although it sounds crude to use that term. But we don't have a good term for peopled mission. Um, uh, it is plausible. Remember, about a meter of ice will stop the radiation. So someday, people, I think, will visit Europa, ultimately, and make ice caves, essentially, right? If we want to explore Europa, we do it by finding or by building uh, an ice cave or by landing something on the surface massive enough that has enough shielding to be safe. Now, our people able to wander around on the surface of Europa, there would need to be either lots of shielding or some sort of magnetic shielding, right? And so then we get back into the science fiction realm, but it is plausible to have some sort of magnetic field in enveloping astronauts in the distant future that would deflect the uh, radiation particles.
so essentially why doesn't Europa have an atmosphere today? It may have had one in the past. It's a small moon, not a lot of gravity, so like, our, like Earth's moon, uh, uh, molecules are, are lost to space over time just because the gravity is low, and so the, the particles will drift away. But also in this radiation environment, the stuff gets, just gets uh, um, uh, stripped off very quickly. So if there are plumes at Europa, they'll, they'll, those particles will be dissociated. Oh, I think my computer's died. This is really sad. I was trying to show the movie, and now it's really unhappy. Um, so the particles will get stripped away. Oh, man. <laughs> I'm going to be on the phone with JPL tomorrow morning, I see. Let me stop there. Um, <laughs> Uh, if there are plumes today, some of that stuff will just freeze to the ground, and some of it, yeah, will be dissociated and uh, stripped away. Is there evidence for aurora or uh, rings around Jupiter resulting from some of these, quote, plumes? Uh, good point. Are, is there evidence for rings or, or related phenomena? Uh, at Jupiter associated with plumes? Not really. So um, at, at Saturn, at Enceladus's orbit, yeah, there's the E-ring, and that's made from stuff spewing off Enceladus. Now, Enceladus has much, much less gravity than even Europa, so lots more can escape, right? So lots of stuff will fall to the ground. The, the particles will fall to the ground uh, at Europa. Um, at the same time, people have done calculations to say, based on what we don't see, we don't see a lot of stuff there, you could limit how much plume activity there could really be. So I, I think it was something like only 10% of what Enceladus spews out is it plausible to have at Europa. So you, you can use. Um, Aurora, I don't think, will be associated with plumes. Ganymede has uh, uh, its own internal uh, magnetic field and there are aurorae at Ganymede associated with that. There might be faint glows at Europa. We have, you know, when we get there, we'll, we'll look for them. Yes. Yeah, there are some, but, it, but aurora imply concentrated at the poles. But there, there, there may be just glow associated with Europa's very thin atmosphere and any plumes if they're there. Right, is there a Europa science coming from the Juno mission, which is going to Jupiter? It's, it's really concentrating at Jupiter. Um, I think there might be some very distant observations of Europa and the ultraviolet, but, um, um, but not a lot coming uh, in terms of Europa science. That's really concentrated on the big guy. Right. Why Europa instead of Enceladus or Mars? Well, it fortunately hasn't been a choice of Europa or Mars. If it were, there would be Europa might have, well, Europa was losing, right? And uh, I, I mentioned Congressman Culberson, who's ensured that we're going to explore Europa and continue to do Mars. Um, as for Enceladus and, and uh, Titan at Saturn, um, those are really important places to explore as well. Enceladus may be spewing its ocean water out into space. If there's life there, we might be able to sample it directly, um, though there are challenges in doing so. It's not easy. Um, and, and Titan probably has an internal ocean, and it has lakes of ethane and methane on the surface. How cool is that? <laughs> that maybe there's some sort of weird life there. So we want to do that too. And NASA is investigating um, an ocean worlds program that would allow for such a thing. So, I mean, I, I would advocate, if I had to choose, I would advocate for Europa because of the potential for the ingredients for life. So even though radiation is deadly to life on the surface, you die in something like eight, eight minutes to eight hours, I think I did the math once, at Europa. Um, if you didn't have a soup, well, it's cold too. Uh, <laughs> but, but that allows for those oxidants, those radiation products, right? That's actually a good thing for life that might exist within. Enceladus doesn't have that. And Enceladus might 
be going through a burst of activity now, um, and it's not clear there's been enough time for life to get going in its ocean. We're still learning uh, at Enceladus. So yeah, I hate having to choose between among the children, you know. But I, 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 think, I think John Culberson would like to add to that. <laughs> I tell you, Congressman Culberson is an advocate of this mission. <laughs> Where did the water come from in the first place? Uh, it's cold out there. There was lots of H2O, lots of water in the nebula from which the sun and the planets formed. And uh, here in the inner solar system, that only, only some of it, only a little bit was able to stay around. Out there in the outer solar system, lots of it was able to stay around in the form of ice. And it wasn't burned off, essentially, and lost. So it was able to condense out there at Europa. And Ganymede and Callisto are about half ice and half rock. Farther from Jupiter, it was warm Jupiter. It was colder out there. Um, and then you go further out in the solar system, Saturn, uh, Uranus, etc. lots of ice. Ice is like rock out there and condensed out and stayed and here in the inner solar system. Uh, lots of it was lost, didn't condense out, just because it was too warm. Thank you. All right, well, first off, let me thank everyone for coming out tonight. Uh, we'd also like to once again acknowledge the sponsorship of Aerojet Rocketdyne and United Launch Alliance. We'll be having the next talk in this series on June 1st when Pamela Comrade from the uh, NASA Goddard Space Flight Center will come out and talk about the topic of life in extreme environments. So that should be a great talk as well. It's been a great series so far. And please uh, join me again in thanking Bob for a fantastic talk. <laughs>